بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان ودعا بدعوتهم إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا بفضلك يا رحم الراحمين Brothers and sisters, Jazakumullah khairan for attending our very first, actually we're doing a book launch here at Kanhul Masjid and inshallah ta'ala, hopefully this is the first of many more as well. And I have a very uh, important announcement, a very good announcement inshallah ta'ala after uh, when Sheikh Omar Subida finishes his talk. So alhamdulillah today's book launch is about uh, Sheikh Omar Subida's collection of Imam Abu Hanifa's fatawa and uh, hadith. Uh, and, and, and the hadith are narrated by Imam Abu Hanifa student, Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani. And I've already done it in my khatir, I spoke about it actually the whole, uh, last, the whole week I've been talking about this. So I'm not going to go into any more details about Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani. i leave that to Ustaz Umar, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, but I want to talk about Ustaz Umar, first of all, okay? And uh, I'll quickly just mention a little bit about him. Ustaz Umar Subida was born and raised in the greater uh, Toronto area, Canada, and in 1990, mashallah, he enrolled in the Institute of Islamic Education, the Darul Uloom that we have in Dewsbury, West Yorkshire, United Kingdom. And the very first thing that Ustaz Umar did in the 90s is that he joined the Hifs class. So you see now Darul Uloom, we have a Hifs department and the Alimiyah department. And you have a choice which one to enroll to. If you're young, then it's ideally best to start with the Hifs. So Ustaz Umar started memorizing the Quran. And mashallah, within three years, he memorized the whole Quran. So he joined 1990 and 1993, memorized the Quran. And then he joined the Alimiyah. Then after that, it is optional whether you want to stay or you leave, but majority of the people, mashallah, they stay, although there are people who leave as well. Um, and then he joined the Alimiya program. The Alimiya program that we have in Dewsbury is uh, seven years, where you study, first thing that we need to study is Urdu language. And I know it's, uh, it's a bizarre for nowadays, people are like, what? Yeah. You see, the language of our teachers and the lecturers are Urdu. And also, uh, many of the books that we study is in Urdu and Arabic in the beginning. Just like when you have English and Arabic nowadays. So we have to learn Urdu. For someone like myself, I've never knew there was a language called Urdu. So when I went to Madrasa, they told me to learn Urdu. I'm like, what's that? You know, and then they start talking. I said, yeah, I heard this language before somewhere, which I can't mention it now anyway. So uh, it was quite easy for me to learn, alhamdulillah. Because Urdu is very close to the Bengali language, you know, a lot of the words. But Ustaz Umar, it was all new for him. He had to learn Urdu first, and then he learned Arabic language. We study all the elementary Arabic books, and then Nahw and Sarf and Balagha, you know, syntax, morphology, Qawaid, Arabic literature, all of that. And then he studied uh, Fiqh, and then Usul al Fiqh, Hadith, Usul al Hadith, then uh, Tafsir, Usul al Tafsir. And we also have something in our Darul Ulum is to study the, all of the six books of Hadith the Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, Nasai, Ibn Majah. We also study Muatta of Imam Malik, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, which is narrated by Imam Yahya ibn Yahya al Laythi, and also by Imam Muhammad ibn al Hassan al Shaybani. You know, both is combined as well. We also study Sharh Ma'anil Athar. Ustaz uh, Umar done all of that, alhamdulillah. And, and after that, uh, he traveled back to his uh, homeland, which is Canada, Toronto. And then he started publishing books. And I would like to mention some of the books that he has already published. Uh, one is called The First Steps in Practicing Islam. Uh, the second one is called Plan Your Day, The Prophet's Way, all in English. The third is How to Live the Life of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Fourth, rethink your world. And then he also done the commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari in English. And he finished two volumes. May Allah give him tawfiq to do more, inshallah. And he also just recently, very recently, done the collection of Imam Abu Hanifa's hadith and fatawa, fatwas. And he's going to talk about that today, inshallah. Uh, currently, he serves as the founder and CEO of Bukhari Academy in Canada. He's also the co-founder and, and dean of Islamic studies at the Mathaba Institute, also in Canada. He's also, uh, uh, he's also one of the uh, founding members of the Halal Monitoring Authority. The, what we have HMC and HFA here, uh, Ustaz Umar is also, uh, uh, mashallah, is one of the co-founders as well. And he's also Imam and Khatib at the, I think it's called the Bramal Islamic Cultural Center also in Canada as well. So inshallah ta'ala, Ustaz Umar Subhida is here with us. He traveled all the way from Canada to meet us. So we'd like to really give him a very warm welcome, inshallah ta'ala. Ustaz will talk about his book, take questions, and after that, 
he will go at the, uh, the multi-purpose room at the back. All the books are there. And those of you who want to buy their books, you could buy their books over there, inshallah. And, uh, and you could also ask Ustaz to sign the books if you need, inshallah ta'ala. Two things I would like to mention very quickly to, 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 before I uh, uh, ask him to come and, and take the chair here. Is one is that Ustaz Umar, one of his hobby is this, because I went to Canada to meet him. He loves sports cars, you know, and he, mashallah, you know, uh, then, let me give an intro before this, because uh, me and Ustaz Zaid Tarapuri, everybody knows him who led Salah here, we went inside his car, and then Zaid asked this question that, how fast does he go? He said, pass, just, you know, fasten your seatbelts, and I'll show you, inshallah ta'ala. And it was the worst decision that, you know, because I just said, Ustaz, just, you know, slow it down a little, because we don't do that in England. You know, we will 70 miles per hour, and that's it, inshallah ta'ala. So, um, and he remind me, you know, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when you should look at, the ulama mentioned, when you should look at the camel, he'll tell you how good the camel is. And Sayyidina Khalid bin Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu, even the old wild horses that you have, you bring it to Khalid bin Walid, he knows how to pet it. He just had, had the skills. Well, we don't have no camels and horses to, we have the cars now. Ustaz knows everything about their cars, the new skills now, alhamdulillah. And also, although he lives in Canada, and I know basketball and hockey is very famous over there, but Ustaz is a very proud supporter of Liverpool Football Club. <laughs> so everybody, I would like to welcome, inshallah ta'ala, Ustaz Umar Sumira, jazakumullah, fal yatafadal. I would like to first and foremost express my deepest gratitude to each and every single one of you uh, for coming out this evening and being part of this program. Especially I want to uh, thank Mulana Mujahid for all the efforts that he's made. Uh, it was just a simple one message I sent to him that I'm planning to come by and that was it. He arranged all these different programs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him uh, the best of outcomes in the hereafter. Um, you know, myself and Mulana Mujahid, we were roommates. Uh, one thing that he didn't tell you, I'm sure some of, them who, some of us who know, he was a big Bruce Lee fan and I was a big Mike Tyson fan. And we had a lot of um, tussles back in those days. He had his style, I had my style, and it was fun. And uh, yeah, I'm just inviting him to come and see my latest sports car, the Ford Mustang. And uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy that even more, inshallah. But alhamdulillah, um, it's really good to be here and have the opportunity to share uh, some of the work that has been rendered by our predecessors and having the opportunity to now bring that to today's generation. Uh, when it comes to this particular book, and as Mulana Mujahid was saying that he's been going over the life of Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, and so forth, uh, one of the things that I noticed that there's, there's no shortage of material uh, when it comes to talking about Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi. Uh, you can find so, much, so many books uh, in multiple languages, right, talking about his history, talking about his development, talking about his contributions. But seldom do you actually see that work with your own eyes. You read about it, that's one thing, from a third party source. But when do we actually get the opportunity to see the work that he rendered? That's a rarity. And this is something that uh, I stumbled across. It wasn't even on purpose, it just happened, the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That one day I was reading a book written by our dear Mufti Taqi Uthmani, Damad Barakatu, and he made a reference to a book called Jami'ul Masanid, which is written by Imam Khawarizmi, rahmatullahi alayhi. And he was saying that there's 15 Masanid of Abu Hanifa compiled in this one collection, this one Jami'ah. I said, that's very interesting. And this is going back in 1995. So in 1996, I went to Makkah al for my first ever Umrah 
I was still a teenager at that time. And uh, I, that time, book shopping in Mecca, it was like going treasure hunting. There, you had so much variety, so many different bookstores. It was, I mean, you can just get lost in there and you'd never want to come out. But and so it was in that uh, one of those visits, I came across this very Jami al Masani on one of the shelves. I go, is this the book that uh, Mufti Taqi was making reference to? And I started going through it. On the spot, I bought it, even though it wasn't in the best of uh, conditions, but just bought it. And I didn't know what use this would be of going forward. I mean, typically we buy a whole bunch of books, Mona Mujahid can read it, and they go on your shelf, they look nice, mashallah, the binding and everything. And sometimes you pull it out, sometimes you don't pull it out, right? Sometimes you pull out a book that you bought two decades later, okay? One decade later, but it's there, it's accessible. And it just so happens that I was, as I was writing uh, the commentary of Sahih al-Bukhari, we got through Kitab al-Badu Wahi, we got through Kitab al-Iman, Kitab al-Ilm, and now we're going to start Kitab al-Wudu. And this is where you're going to get the fiqh abwab. and one of the things that uh, one of my mentors had instructed me that you want to try and make this knowledge as accessible as possible, as comprehensible as possible, and as easy as possible. The more you're going to make it complicated, the more you're going to put in this jargon in there, uh, less people are going to be able to benefit. So one of the ideas that was brought to the table was to create madhab charts, which would mean that you, you put a title of what the issue is, you cite the madhab name, you then talk about their stance on the next uh, part, part of the chart, and the final part of the chart, you're going to show their evidences. So at least, you know, there would be clarity for the person that wants to have uh, more information on the issue that's being discussed. But when you go through this, you see that the commentators, they have their biases. You can't have a Hanafi representing a Shafi'i properly. And you can't have a Shafi'i representing a Hanafi properly and whatever the case is. So, you know, when it comes to the Bukhari commentaries, one of the first people that ever uh, wrote a comprehensive commentary is Ibn Battal, who is a Maliki scholar. Going forward, you're going to have Qastalani. Then comes the likes of Ibn Hajar and Allama Aini. And there's a lot of their material that they bring into their own material. There was no such thing as plagiarism laws back in those days. So you can take chunks of someone else's book and make it part of your book and there's no reference. Right? Until you actually come across it, I read this somewhere. Okay? And, and it's line by line verbatim. Everything is copied. So the thing is that when one is talking about the stance of the other, you are going to see um, a very different picture at times when you actually go to the people who are part of that platform. So if I was to go to a Shafi'i book, I'm going to see different explanations and different approaches I would never get from a Hanifi perspective. Uh, say for example, you know, when we are studying uh, fiqh, and when it gets to comparative fiqh, it's typically Hanafis against Shafi'is, right? Typically. And the, 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 like the rare time you're going to get a reference to a Maliki. But I remember when writing um, the commentary, there was this piece I needed to do on Mursal Hadiths. And I know Imam al-Shafi'i Rala. So I thought it's just going to be as easy as going through the index, finding where it is, and you know, you just go to the page, cite it, end of story. It wasn't the case. There was nothing in the index. So then it just so happens, I decided, okay, where would it most likely be located in the discussions? You know, you just try and, and guesstimate. So you go through those sections, there's no mention of it. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is a huge book. And I need this reference. I don't want to quote a third party reference saying that they had got it from Arisala when I have Arisala in my hands right now. And literally, I had to read 400 pages to find what I was looking for. Literally, 400 pages I had to go through, but I was thinking in my mind that that was one of the biggest blessings in disguise, because I got to see firsthand what Imam al-Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi has got to say. And I was completely impressed, because that's not something that is going to be shared with us from a person subscribing to another platform. So it was a huge eye-opener. Right? And seeing, mashallah, the command, the approach, right? the proficiency in his presentation, it was, it was like second to none. I was very impressed. 
until you know we found what we were looking for so what i'm trying to say from all of this is that when i came across this roadblock you can say like who am i going to quote when it comes to madhabs will i quote the commentators because i'm seeing that it's not you know that accurate of a representation at times or do i go a step ahead and i go to the relied upon books of each madhab or do i go a step ahead of that and go to the imams of the people who have inspired these madhabs because the imams didn't come to form madhabs they came to make contributions it just so happens that people appreciated those contributions to a degree that they carried on this legacy and it just became more and more developed as time went by so this was a little um, turmoil that I was going through internally and I said you know what I need to take a break from this commentary and I'm going to now focus on uh, what I plan to do for many years and in the excuse of doing this I can brush up on many fiqh issues and then you know look at what Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi is really saying and this was in itself a whole journey on its own which took four years and to get here it took four years so four years took a break and just focusing on this and I felt that one is you know when I was going through the Jamia al Masanid that's when I finally picked it up you know you're picking it out of the shelf you're brushing off all the dust you know, making sure the pages are still, you know, intact because after a period of time when it comes to old books, the pages can easily fall off. So, you know, making sure I'm very careful, well, careful with this book. And as I'm going through it, I'm just getting more and more mesmerized by the material that's in there. And I'm thinking, why is this not translated? Why is this not accessible? Because you are now reading the ahadith, the Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi himself has reported okay and for, through um, multiple students have taken this uh, and they made their own masani that's how you got 15 different musnads at the very least in this one collection so i thought this is something that needs to really get out there people need to see this but then if you were to translate it just do a simple translation it may not be that much of a benefit so what we decided to do is you know rip off a bit of Imam Bukhari's style, rip off a bit of Imam Malik's style and his motta, and do a fusion between the two. But Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, his style in uh, the Jami' al-Sahih is that he's going to formulate um, a conclusion. And he's addressing a scholarly issue that was part of the scholarly discourse of the time. His style wasn't one of going after an individual, telling you how wrong they are, and doing character assassination, as is unfortunately the, the social media environment of today. Right? Take the other guy down because I gotta defend the haq. I gotta defend the truth. Right? People have gotta be saved and secure from this person's fitna. This is the jargon that you continuously hear. Imam Bukhari wasn't like that. Imam Bukhari he gave you his contribution and if he needed to talk about the other side on the rare occasion he says qala ba'dun nas like some people say and he'll just give you a couple you start from 4th century material from Imam Quduri's time you don't go be, you don't go beyond that and it's everything post 4th century um, so all the stuff that happened before you have reference to it you read about it that Imam Muhammad has written these books but you actually never study them right? you never study uh, the, uh, the, the Asal or the Jami al-Saghir Jami al-Kabir al you never study any of that stuff but you just have reference to it now when it comes to the Asal which is something that was compiled after Imam Muhammad had passed away right I mean these are actually little books that are all put together in one big compendium and I started going through that and again it was a whole new world that opened up I felt this needs to get out as well so let's fuse the two let's get Imam, Muha Imam Abu Hanifa's hadith and let's get thing Imam Muhammad's material like the Masail that are related to that narration put it together and share it with the community and for the first time in the English language you have material that's from right in the beginning okay yes you have alhamdulillah our uh, dear brothers at Turath they've done the Kitab al-Athar by Imam Muhammad rahmatullahi alayhi Allah bless them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to increase them in their khidmat and their services but that's just one drop in the ocean 
right? There's so much more. So this is one contribution that we wanted to make. And also at the same time to dispel many of the misconceptions that are out there. One of the things I wanted to share, you know, how many of us have heard, and I'm sure we've heard this many a times, Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi doesn't know hadith. Well, Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, he only reports weak hadith. Well, Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, he basically has re um, reported probably 175 hadith. Some people say 17. You want to go Dar Qutni, he says 17. Some people say 75. Some people say 175. And then they want to say that 50% of that he got absolutely wrong. So you see all this third party material that is being sent your way just not recently. Someone had sent me a whole book, a PDF, right, about the refutation of Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi. 111 pages of that was just dedicated on the justification to criticize him. Okay, so you get to 111 pages. Then you start the actual critique. And honestly, I'm sitting in the masjid, I couldn't get past three pages. I couldn't digest it. Simply because now after doing this whole project for four years and then seeing what criticism is being put It's completely untrue. It's completely false. And I said, I, I'm not going to read this or my blood pressure Which is already high is going to get even higher and I don't need a heart attack or a stroke Right, so put that away. So what we wanted to do is give people the opportunity to see the material yourself And we have to understand where does Abu Hanifa fall in the timeline? of all of this. The timeline is the most important thing because timeline gives you context. And in the time of Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, there's no such thing as the terminology of Sahih, Da'if and all that because he's living in a time where the, where the compilation of hadith has now begun at a state level. Now what does that mean? Let's go back all the way to the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as the Qur'an was being revealed, he had his scribes and they would basically, <clears throat> excuse me, inscribe it on whatever was available. They didn't have paper, so whether it's parchment, bone, stone, whatever you can inscribe it on, they inscribed it, right? And then afterwards you have Abu Hanifa Rahmatullahi sorry, and afterwards you have the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passing, and the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, where many of the Qur'a are losing their lives because the primary um, preservation methodology uh, for the Qur'an was memorization amongst the Ummiyun, right? The people who don't have reading and writing skills. Uh, reading and writing the Qur'an was a secondary method of preserving the Qur'an. It wasn't the prime method. Prime method was memorization. And you had only two classes back in those days. You had Ummi or Qari. Qari in those days didn't mean a person that can recite the Quran in a beautiful tone and so forth. Qari meant an educated individual. Now, these people are being sent to war, right, during the Ridda Wars as we know them, and they're losing their lives in big numbers. Umar radiallahu is going to come to Abu Bakr radiallahu and eventually persuade him that we need to make a master copy of the Quran, lest portions of it are lost because it's within people's hearts they're dying that means the Quran is also going to die so this is one of the things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had used right he's made the thing the the commitment that he is going to preserve his revelation right inna he's made that commitment and this is one of those modes where this master copy was finally made and what was the need because the people who are going to be the prime go-to individuals to the, learn the Qur'an are going. Okay, they're leaving this world. Now when it comes to hadith, who did you go to to learn about the Prophet You go to the Sahaba which are in ample numbers. And hadith is pretty much what, if you want to simplify it, it's one Sahabi's experience with the Prophet If you think about it, right? It's anecdotes. He's telling you what he saw. He's telling you what he heard. He's telling you the experience that he had. That's what we call hadith in very simple words without all the technical jargon. So when the people who experienced the Prophet ﷺ are now at the end of their life cycle, right? The pretty much a whole century has gone by. Abu Hanifa is born in the year 80. That's the tail end 
of the Sahaba's lives, you're going to have only a handful left, Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh, and so forth. It's only a handful left. And then you're going to come to the turn of the century. We have Umar bin Abdul Aziz, who's known as the second Umar, whose job is pretty much to restore, uh, you know, civility at the very least in the Umayyad dynasty where everything had become corrupt. One of the things that he saw is that there is a need here. Right? The need is that these Sahaba are going. And it's only so long that the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be in circulation and give it a few generations, they may also disappear. Okay? They may also disappear. Because again, the primary preservation mode is memorization. Yes, people are documenting, but on a personal level. Right? Abu Hanifa Rahmatullah, same thing, on a personal level. But not, you know, and you didn't have the printing press back in those days, right? You're not going to write a book and send it off to the printers and off it goes, it gets published and it's for sale. It didn't, it didn't work like that. You had to sit down and word for word copy out the manuscript or whatever dictation the teacher is giving you. Right? And that's why we have so many different versions of Imam Malik's Mu'atta. We just heard of two right now. We have Yahya bin Yahya's version, which is the most popular. Right? With Sahih Bukhari, there are many versions, but the one that's popular is Firabri's. Right? And you have Imam Muhammad's version of the Imam uh, of the Mu'atta, which is slightly different from the one that Yahya bin Yahya has compiled. So you have these different versions. The thing is that if it's going to happen on a personal level, how long? How long is this going to last? Right? How long is this going to last? So the people of our past were people who didn't live just for today. They saw down the road. Right? They're people of foresight. And that's what you and I want to become. Don't just think about the now. Think about what's going to happen five generations from now, ten generations from now. And you're going to be at a completely different level at that time. Your decision-making process is going to be completely different. You will become more efficient because now you're trying to build something that is not just going to be benefited by you, but by your great-grandchildren, your great-great-grandchildren and so forth, creating a legacy. So Imam, so, um, Imam um, sorry, Omar bin Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah, he basically has seen this potential danger. And he commissions two individuals, Abu Bakr ibn Hazm, which Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi writes about, and Ibn Abi Shayba. Sorry, what am I saying? Uh, Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. Okay, so these two people have been commissioned now to collect everything that is in circulation of the words of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Umar bin Abdul Aziz was very specific, and you can see it in Sahih Bukhari. He's very specific. Only collect the reports of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Nothing else. So Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, he's living during this age, the age of compilation. All of these terminologies that you have, Sahih, Da'if, Hassan Bidati, Hassan Li Ghayrihi, and all of this stuff, this is going to be developed way later. Okay, when the, the, the time between the individuals and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been extended. Okay, so Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, is living in this age. In the age where his connection to the Prophet وسلم, is not lengthy. And we go through this book and you see his own Asanid. I on purpose left the Asanid there for people to go ahead and scrutinize and see is it da'if or not. Right? And it's many of the same Asanid that Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi is using generations later. Well, two generations later. Right? Or Imam Muslim is using two generations later. So what you have here is Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, compiling narrations that are going to be supportive or well let me just say this let me rephrase that imam abu hanifa rahmatullahi he had a huge collection of his own narrations but the one thing that was different between him and imam malik rahmatullahi alayhi, was that he did not dedicate time right to simply narrate hadiths that's not what he was uh, focused on he was focused on hadith analysis he was focused on deduction. He was focused on practical application of the hadith. And whatever he related in class, that was captured by his students, which then in turn became that student, his, he made a musnad of Abu Hanifa. Musnad basically means the hadith of one particular individual. That's really what a musnad is, right? So musnad of Imam Ahmad. This is all the reports of Imam Ahmad himself 
uh, with his own asanid. Imam Abu Hanifa, whatever his students, and you can see all the different uh, students are listed inside the book and their isnad to Abu Hanifa, it's all inside there. So basically they made their own collections, those collections lived on for generations and then they made it up into Imam Khawarizmi's book and he put it all together for us to read. And this is where that has been taken from. Now, there's 500 narrations inside there, but there's much more. I selected 500 for my, this collection, but that doesn't mean there's only 500. There's at least 2,000 just in that uh, one compilation. So now, going back to Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi alayhi, remember, people criticize, oh, which book of hadith did he write? No, he didn't write anything because that wasn't his focus. Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi alayhi, started his uh, scholarly um, journey as a theologian, not as a jurist. He started it as a theologian. Like he was now up against the Mu'tazilites and the Khawarij back in those days debating until he got tired of it. He said, this is not the way right, of the Sahaba. This is not the way the companions debate after debate after debate. He got tired of it. And then well, one thing that did come out of it is that at least he gave us the first treatise on what we know as Sunni doctrine, known as Fiqh al-Akbar. And it's a phenomenal piece of work, right? I would encourage you, if you haven't got a copy, make sure you do get a copy. Mufti Abdurrahman Mangera, a good friend of mine, he is the one that had translated it, and he has published it under his publishing company, White Thread Press. Um, you know, just go through it. It's, it's very beneficial. So Abu Hanifa, rahmatullah, at least gave us that. But then when he came, came to fiqh, Remember, he didn't do, and I need people to understand this, he didn't do a double weekend seminar, a double weekend course. He didn't do a four month course. He went into the company of the best of the time. Hamad bin Abi Suleiman. Hamad bin Abi Suleiman, just for you to understand the chain right now. Where, what, what river is he a part of? He basically is going to take you through Ibrahim al nakhai to the students of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu to Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu himself. And I need you to understand why this is so important and why Abu Hanifa rahmatullah's legacy is so rich, right? Who he got connected with. Remember, in the time of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu, when uh, thing, um, Iraq has been taken over under uh, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu's command there, uh, this whole section known as the Sasanian Empire, which we refer to as the Persian Empire, they are not the same as the people of Hijaz. I need you to understand mindset here. Hijaz is primarily an Ummi community, right? And when it comes to Ummi communities, you don't expect intellectual, intellectualism from those regions. The more of an ummi you will be, life has to be black or white. There's no gray area. Okay, it has to be black or white. Why do you think the Quran is primarily stories when it's telling you, uh, when it's teaching you principles? It's teaching you through stories, right? So it's got to be black or white. But when it comes to the people of the Sasanian Empire, these were intellectuals. These are highly educated people. They're coming from a civilization that spans well over a thousand years. Right? So, these people, they're a different breed of people. And if you're going to now educate them about the Islam, you're going to need to send your best. And this is where Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu decides to send Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. And who is he? The first batch of people that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu brought after his own personal conversion to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There were six people. In that group was Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. He was there pretty much from day one. Okay, he's there from day one of, of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's mission. Okay, and he's pretty much been with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam throughout, with the exception of the time when he did the hijrah to Habsha, right? And then when he came back, he himself has learnt what seventy surahs from the mouth of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam out of the, the hundred and fourteen. In the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he has been authorized by the Prophet ﷺ to teach the Qur'an, think about that, authorized, ijazah if you want to call it, by the Prophet ﷺ himself, he selected four people, Ubay bin Ka'ab, Mu'adh bin Jabal, Abdullah bin Masood, and Salim Mawla, bin, uh, Mawla Abi Hudayfa. So, four people, he's one of those people, and the Prophet ﷺ had such confidence in him, 
Then he's telling people, whatever Abdullah bin Mas'ud tells you, فَصَدِّقُوهُ Believe him. Okay, so you have a mountain here. And Umar ibn Khattab selects him as the teacher for those people, even though he needs himself. He, needs, he writes in a letter, I am preferring you people over myself when it comes to him, even though I need him. Okay, but he sent him off there. And Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu anh, he didn't waste any time getting there. When he got there, he created an army of Abdullah bin Masood's. Put it like that. An army of Abdullah bin Masood's. But he didn't stay there for long. Think about this. He stayed there for the reign of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh. Then during the reign of Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anh, Uthman called him back radiallahu anh. The people down in Iraq did not like this. Because Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu was everything to them. He was their connection to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And that's being taken away. Okay, that's being taken away. They became defensive to the extent they were prepared to stand in his way if some, someone is now going to want to snatch him. But Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu anh was a man of discipline and principle. He made it very clear that Amir has said, Sami'ana wa ta'ana, simple. He, he made a statement to the effect that the doors of fitna are about to open. The doors of fitna are about to open. I don't want to be that person who will, who will open that first door. It's best to just go back. But he didn't leave those people as an orphan. Okay? These people were so now enriched with what Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu anhu to contribute that this is where okay, that fountain turns into a lake, into an ocean that has many different rivers. Okay, it all starts from there. So Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu is going to have prime students such as Aswad bin Yazid and Alqama bin Qais. They have a nephew, Ibrahim al nakhai who will be pretty much the champion of fiqh in that area. And, his and Ibrahim al nakhai remember, look at the Asanid of uh, uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, you're going to see Ibrahim al nakhais name appear so many times. Okay, even Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi is taking from him. Okay, so Ibrahim al nakhais name appears a lot in the Asanid. So Ibrahim al nakhai his prime student is Hamad bin Abi Suleiman, who Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi became a student of well over a decade, until he passed. And, Abd and Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi didn't really stop his studies, even though he was pretty much taking, he was the successor of Hamad bin Abi Suleiman, but then came a period where he took a seven year gap and he's going to Makkatul Mukarramah under the uh, tutelage of Ata bin Abi Rabah, the student of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he's going to stay there for seven years. And then he's going to come back and imagine how refined he's going to be. What I want to share with you is the level of dedication. The level of dedication. And the audacity of a person like myself who comes in the, you know, 14 centuries later, I'll say, Abu Hanifa, what did he know? Okay, or he doesn't even know hadith. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. He doesn't even know what Sahih hadith is. Think about that. The audacity of that statement. That in itself needs to be thing, tackled. So Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, he was focused on hadith analysis. Yes, he compiled a lot, but then how do you apply this? So one person, this is also in the book, someone visited his house and they're going to see his shelves filled with uh, books. They're going to ask, Mahada, what, what is this? And say, these are books of hadith that I have compiled, but I only use what I feel is of benefit. I only use what I see as a benefit, and that is in the fiqh, right, that is being developed. And Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi wasn't, he didn't start fiqh. Fiqh was already going on before. When you look at his narrations in the Jami al Masanid, he's typically quoting the fatawa of Ibrahim al Nakhai as passed to him through Hamad bin Abi Suleiman. You're seeing his fatwas appear all the time. You even see in Kitab al Athar. He's typically quoting Ibrahim al Nakhai. Okay, so you can see he's a big fan of Ibrahim al Nakhai. But what he did, which was so different, is he grew the art of speaking where the Qur'an and Hadith is silent. Where the Qur'an and Hadith has not addressed something, that's when he is going to speak through the art of analogy, which he developed in a way that no person before had developed. Right? Through the, uh, what's it called, the um, uh, identifying the illa and so forth, and going ahead and deducing other masa'in and so forth. So that's something that he was 
uh, very famous for, he got famous for. And then people didn't like what he was doing because they felt that he's going against the narration. So I'll give you an example, this is also in the book. Uh, I believe it was Ibn Uyayna, one of his contemporaries. They're going to go and um, they're going to uh, cite a hadith. Al-Bayyani bil khayar ma lam yatafarraqa wa fi riwayatin ma lam yaftariqa. So there's this narration where two individuals who are engaged in a business transaction, they have the opportunity to terminate the sale until they don't separate. Okay? Until they don't separate. Now, before I go on with the narration, what would that mean to you? What does separation mean to you? Anyone? Yes? Does that mean when the deal is off, as in like, there's going to be no kind of like uh, acceptable amount to be paid to them? No, when you just look at the word itself, if taraka or the farraka, to separate, what does separate itself? What's the first connotation that comes to your mind? Going your separate ways? Going your separate, physical separation, right? So like, that means that so long as a conversation is going on, you have the opportunity to terminate the sale, but the moment you've gone your separate ways, he's gone there, this person's gone there, then that's it. The sale is binding and each party must honor their commitment, right? That's pretty much what it means. That's going to be the connotation that comes to people's mind at the get-go. But Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi poses a simple question to Ibn Uyayna. What if the two were on a boat? Okay, what if the two were on a boat? And you understand it in a context of those days. That if you're traveling by sea, you're going to be together for an extended period of time. So what would be the application of this hadith? That, does that mean that since they haven't physically separated, physically they're together, and this journey went on, say for example, a week, this person at the end of the journey can turn around and say, you know what, I'm not interested in the sale, I, I'm, I'm taking my word back. Is that the application? Ibn Uyayna didn't like this. He felt that Abu Hanifa is challenging the actual hadith. And all he's challenging is the understanding. And in his words, are, have you seen anything more evil than this? That's all he re re responded with. Have you seen anything more evil than this? Aswat min hadha? So uh, Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi, that's what he was focused on. And remember, his conclusion on this is, this is not in reference to bodily separation. It is in terms of conversational separation. You finish the conversation, you're, you're talking about something else, now the sale is binding. Okay, and you have to honor what you've committed to. So that's just an example. But where hadith is, Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi will not speak. And there's plenty of examples of that. Okay, there's plenty of examples. So. Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi what was his methodology? Remember, he's going to take from the Qur'an and when it comes to hadith, in those days when that term, that definition of sahih did not exist in his time. Keep this in mind. And it did not exist even in Imam Malik's time. The definition that Imam Bukhari goes with, the definition that Imam Muslim goes with, those definitions did not exist. Right? It was more, remember, what are you trying to do when you're, try, when you're uh, classifying something as authentic? You are basically coming to the conclusion that based on your study, you can safely attribute these words to the Prophet ﷺ. That's really what it comes down to. It's a trust issue. Okay, it's a trust issue. There is less of a trust issue in the time of Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik than there is in the time of Imam Bukhari. Look at the timeline. Imam Abu Hanifa is born in 80, passes in 150. Imam Bukhari is born in 194. Okay, four decades later. And he's going to pass away in 256. So there's a whole gap here. Things change in one year, let alone in 40 years, let alone in half a century. Things change. And the more further you're going to get, the more restrictive you're going to be. And everyone's got their own criteria of what they seem and deem as authentic. Between even Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, there's a difference. Right? And that's why if you study Im Sahih Muslim, Sahih Muslim is predominantly on educating you on A-class Asanid and B-class Asanid. All are authentic, but he's now showing you, here's A-class in this section, here's B-class. That's really what it's focused on. So, 
Everyone's got their own criteria. Imam Tirmidhi's got his own criteria. Imam Nasa'i is considered one of the mutashaddidun. He's got his own criteria. So everyone comes up with their own criteria. It goes down to what you rely on. So Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi would be relying on what is in circulation amongst the credible scholars. The credible scholars of the time. And he's got his own asanid which you can clearly read up. Right? You know, they say that uh, the golden chain of hadith is Imam Malik reporting from Nafi from Ibn Umar radiallahu an. Abu Hanifa reports from Nafi as well. And uh, to Ibn Umar radiallahu an. So what makes him more or less? And there's narrations of that. Imam Abu Hanifa did not have any issues even reporting from Imam Malik, which is also in the book. So they didn't have these barriers which we have created today. Understand that. They didn't have those barriers. And Abu Hanifa, and I'll say this in closing, I'm not sure how much time do I have. <laughs> as long as I'm not boring you. Am I boring you guys? No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Ashar al inshallah. Right. So, um, Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi alayhi, was a person of empowerment. Understand this. He was a man of empowerment, not of dictation. He wasn't self-absorbed that you follow me and only me and nothing but me. And if you go to another sheikh, I'm going to be heavily offended. That wasn't him. And that wasn't his modus well. Remember, even though he dedicated a chunk of his life to Hamad bin Abi Suleiman, he didn't limit himself to Hamad bin Abi Suleiman. How is it that he's got a teacher that amount to 4,000? Think about this. How, how does that even happen? Because you learned from 4,000 people. And the more you learn, imagine how broad your horizon is going to be. Islam, when you get into it, it's a sea without shores. It's an ocean that knows no limits when it comes to the depth that this tradition has got to offer. And the intellectualism that's behind it, it's wow, subhanAllah. Even in secular institutions, I don't want to get political, but secular institutions fall short if you actually go into the depth of what Islamic tradition has got to offer. But what has happened is throughout the generations we've come down to boxing things, okay, and trying to put barriers of control which has now made us deprived from all that richness. But Abu Hanifa rahmatullah wasn't like that. And you know, it's up to you whether you want to keep boxed or you want to go ahead and dig more. Right? And dedicate time to studying and dedicate time to uh, pursuing this. So, Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi alayhi, as I said, was a man of empowerment. Just for example, when it comes to uh, his student base, he had three tiers of students. He had tier one, which are people just coming to generally learn fiqh. And what he would do is group them up and start debates. Okay? They start, this is one group debating here, another group debating here. And they want to have issues debating with him. And he wouldn't have issues engaging with them. And Ibn Uyayna is going to come, he's going to see this. Mahada, like, what is this? What type of classroom setting is this? And he says, Da'hum, leave them alone. This is how they're going to develop. So he is a man of empowerment. He wasn't like, I lecture, you listen, take notes, and make sure you, say, you follow what I say verbatim. That wasn't him. So that was only tier one. Tier two is where you're going to have the students that are actively now trying to solve the issues of the day and also solve potential issues that may arise. So that's tier two. Then tier three is going to be like 17 students that he's dedicated his time to, where he's making them the next generation muftis and the next generation qadis. Okay, so this was the levels. Now, you can understand the level of empowerment that he's uh, given through the life of Imam Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani. Imam Muhammad was only 18 years old when Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi passed away. He hasn't completed his studies with Abu Hanifa. He's going to then turn to Abu Yusuf, Imam Abu Hanifa's prime student, complete his studies from there, and then he's going to venture off to Medina. And he's going to go and stay under the company of Imam Malik for three years. That's where that muatta comes from. And this is where he's, the book that he reads, he writes Kitab al Hujja ala Ahli Medina, which you have a lot of translations of in this book. That's where it's going to come from, where he does comparative fiqh between Madani fiqh and Iraqi fiqh. And he's showing how Iraqi fiqh is more consistent with hadith than, uh, what's it called, Madani fiqh. He, like, is, he goes all out. It's like, for him, it's like the gloves have been taken off. So he goes all out in this. 
And so Imam Muhammad rahmatullahi alayhi, look at he's transitioning from one teacher to another and you'd think, oh, he became a Hanafi to a Maliki. No, these madhabs didn't exist. They didn't exist at that time. They were just teachers teaching, right? And Imam uh, Muhammad then, what, hap what becomes of him? He becomes the first teacher of fiqh for Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i. Imam al-Shafi'i starts his journey in fiqh through Imam Muhammad rahmatullahi alayhi. And Imam al-Shafi'i going forward, he becomes one of the teachers of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal in fiqh. And he's also the student of Imam Malik, right, in, in hadith. So, can you see how intertwined they are? What they're doing, they simply made contributions, but rich contributions that developed whole schools, right, of, of methodology and so forth, which we, you and I are benefiting from today. So that's what I want you to understand about the empowerment level, right? Venturing, learning, and if, if you look at Imam al-Shafi'i rahmatullahi's uh, biography, did you know he even learned from atheists? He learned from people that were from other thought processes. Why? Because he was trying to gain perspective. He's trying to understand where they're coming from. Instead of having, you know, preconceived notions or imaginary notions, many times this is what we develop, right? We think, oh, they're like this, they're like that. No, listen to them. Hear them out. Read their material. This is if you're going, going into Islamic studies, that is, right? Read that and then you continue to develop, develop because then you will have proper command and proper insight on the issue as opposed to relying on hearsay or just preconceived notions. So what I want us to go away with is an understanding that we have so many people that have contributed to the development of our tradition that you and I are benefiting from today. And in order for us to have a level of appreciation of what they did for us, books like this are now being released so that we can read it ourselves. And at the very least, we make dua, okay, that they did this for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them, Allah elevate their status, Allah give them the best of places in Jannah, and hopefully we can be part of that river, right, that's flowing and create a legacy of our own, be inspired. I'll finish off with this one story, inshallah, and that's it. Remember, Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, he is from an, a business background, right? He's from an affluent family. He wasn't from a poor family. He's from an affluent family. And his roots actually go back to Afghanistan. So he's a Persian. He comes from a, a, a well-to-do family. He's in a textile business. And he's going to one day bump into who we know as Imam Sha'bi, Amr al-Sha'bi. He's going to uh, bump into him one day. And Imam Sha'bi, rahmatullahi alayhi, prominent muhaddith, again, you'll see that name, Sha'bi, in the Asanid of Imam Bukhari uh, when it comes to Jami, his Sahih Bukhari. You'll see that name pop up so many times. So this person, Imam Sha'bi, he's going to ask Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi alayhi, whose gatherings do you attend? And what he's making reference to is the gatherings of knowledge, which was many. And he's going to give a response, uh, oh, I go to this person and this person who have a business background. So I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about halaqatul ilm. Who do you go to? And he didn't go to anyone at that time. It just wasn't his thing. And all Imam al-Sha'bi had to say is like, just give your attention. I'm paraphrasing him. Like, start going down this path because I see something in you. Okay? I see something in you. And that's all it took for this great individual to be developed. You don't know who your words will inspire. You could inspire the next great leader in this field or that field. All it takes is just a bit of encouragement. May Allah give us all the ability to understand and practice what has been said. JazakAllah khairan. You know, I just want to add one thing here. Uh, Ustaz Umar says something so beautifully. When um, Abdullah bin Mas'ud went to Kufa, he created an army of Abdullah bin Mas'ud. So what a beautiful statement to, for us to reflect on. One of our teachers used to say that one of the signs of a great teacher or a good teacher or an influential teacher is that he creates the best version of him. Some people like they're very good at they want to say good. That's not good enough. You need to, if you could create the best version of you, your students have similar knowledge or better, then you are a good teacher. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud did that, subhanAllah. And testament to Abdullah bin Mas'ud did in Kufa, 
is that when Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he made Kufa Darul Khilafa, you know what he said? He met with students of knowledge, people speaking fluent Arabic, they know Hadith, and you know, these people are quoting Tafsir. He was so mesmerized and he said, Rahimullah ibn Ummi Abd, laqad zayyana hadihi al-qariyata ilman, may Allah have mercy and illuminate Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, his nickname was Umm Abd. He said, Ibn Umm Abd, he said, he has illuminated the city with knowledge. This is what Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And so how they did this, wherever they went, mashallah ta'ala. Um, anyway, alhamdulillah, Ustaz is here. Um, if you have any questions, then you could raise your hand. Please don't ask any fifth question. I'm here for you for that, inshallah, another day, not today as well. Anything about the book? Or anything that you heard from the talk, your more clarification. If you have that, then go ahead, please. Yes, please go. Assalamualaikum. 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 Khairan for your talk. Very beneficial. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Um, I want to ask about the positions of Abu Hanifa, his actual fiqh, because I understand that Imam uh, Abu Shaybani and Imam Abu Yusuf, they had their own view about many of the issues. So they, how did we get the transmission of his opinions? If his students changed his views when they when they wrote the books, they, they put their own stamp on it, their own view, because they were scholars in their own right. So how do we get the positions of Abu Hanifa if his students had their own view? Well, simple. It's uh, Imam Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani, rahimahullah, is the pen of Abu Hanifa. So when you look at Asal, uh, there he is primarily quoting the fatwas of Abu Hanifa. And where he differs, he makes that very clear. That this is my position, but Abu Hanifa says this. Abu Yusuf says this. Or you can see in Jamil Saghir, for example, he is relating just the fatwas of Abu Hanifa through Abu Yusuf. It's not his own work. So it's books like this through which we get the position. And you know, when, you're, when a person subscribes to the Hanafi Madhab, they're not subscribing just to the fatwas of Abu Hanifa. If I'm being generous, Abu Hanifa's fatwas that are used in Hanafi fiqh, they're probably 20 to 25 percent, if I'm being generous, right? The rest is the contributions of successive generations, whether and inspired primarily by the works of Imam Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani, and they're used as principal works from which you expand. But uh, the Hanafi madhab as we know it today is not 100 percent the fatwas of Abu Hanifa. Okay, it's just a small amount, a small percentage, and what you have is generations of scholars' works that you're benefiting from. Okay. 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 I was always under the impression that he first learned from Muslim Khalid Zindi, and that was his like base, and then he moved on to uh, Muhammad bin Hassan al um, My request is, I know you've spent a lot of time writing this, and, you've, and I've also been watching some of your lectures online, going through the individual narrations. Is there any chance you would write something like a small paper based on your kind of findings from um, the Hujjah al Ahl al-Madina of Ibn Hassan? Because I think that would be really, really interesting. I say this to someone who spent a lot of time uh, reading Nani Kifta and saying Nani Kifta. Uh, a paper of what nature? Like, what, what would the analysis be? Something that summarized, if you like, you know the Kitab al Asa that's been published? Mm -hmm. The first volume has a really interesting introduction to yes. the different types of this thing like that, that right. Asa does, and the methodology. And I think, again, is something that, if translated, would be really, really beneficial. Yeah, it is a very good work, yes. And I think something similar to show the different approaches. Uh, demonstrating his differences in Kitab al would be really, really interesting for an English-speaking audience because we've been drowned in Britain with a lot of the nonsense <laughs> about... Uh, I'm sorry to be... I don't mean to be... No, it's all right. Mm -hmm. We've been drowned in a lot of the nonsense about how Hadi Farada Wahan didn't have Hadi. Well, like you said, that I'll put me into the 17 or whatever mm -hmm. it may be. We've heard a lot of that stuff. I mean, I grew up in an environment and that was very normal. Um, I just think it'd be really, really good to have something, even if it's short, like a short paper that would be circulated because we've had the alternative PDFs. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very good suggestion. It didn't cross my mind, no. And right now my efforts are back on writing the third volume of uh, Sahih Bukhari, so that, uh, you know, that's very time-consuming. But uh, definitely, inshallah, I make a mental note of that. 
And yeah, what you're saying, especially that introduction to also that's an awesome piece of work. I benefited a lot personally from that. Maybe in the future, if myself, I can't do it, get one of our students to do it, inshallah. But definitely we'll take that into consideration. Okay. Anyway, mashallah, he's also a writer and researcher as well. And um, I've read a couple of his books as well. Last time we were just seeing him, I'll speak to him later. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much for that. Anyone else have any direct questions? Yes. Qais, even Amir. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank uh, so I just wanted to find out um, why is that personally? Is it because they crystallized the, that methodology, number one? And number two, it's Ahlul Rais is seen as a negative yes. situation. How did that come about? I, you know, honestly, I haven't really been able to pinpoint the origins of it because there's so many different uh, viewpoints on that. Um, it's one of the things that you do find is that the muhaddithun were averse uh, to Abu Hanifa's methodology because they did feel that he is, for some reason, um, not corresponding with hadith, when that wasn't the case. And yes, um, because he had now championed this whole thing about Qiyas and, and tackling, look, the difference between Imam Malik and him, Imam Malik is dealing with the now. Don't bring to me hypothetical situations. Bring practical ones who give solutions. Abu Hanifa was the one that opened that door. Not just open, he blasted it open. Right? Where let's talk about what would potentially happen tomorrow. And just tackle that. And all of that stuff that happens tomorrow is not necessarily going to have its solutions found in Quran and Hadith. But you will use the principles that you give from Quran and Hadith. So he's the one that basically had now really. Uh, let that flow, if you want to call it. And I guess that's probably one of the reasons why a lot of people say that they're Ahlul Rai. There are different interpretations of even what Ahlul Rai means. Right? So, Wallahu I can't. I haven't found a thing where I can pinpoint it to. But most of the, just add to start what you said, most of the Mutatadimi actually use Ahlul Rai as a positive. Like, like what Ustaz gave example on, he has, when Abu Hanifa was discussing with Sufyan and Uyayna, you know, it's looking at the ilal, looking at the you know the actual uh, uh, you know the cause behind the hadith. That's what they call him Ahlul Rai. Anyway, but there are differences. Probably that. A question from upstairs. Uh, this is from the sisters. We have an audience of sisters of children. Well. I'm one second, sisters. If you have any question, then you can text inshallah that I'll read it out. What is one prominent difference you find in methodology of Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi'i? Is it the use of matan? Is it the the way and the frequency of use of qiyas, one highlight different in the Rishtihad. This is the question that I get a lot. Uh, as a teacher of Islam, a jurisprudent of Sulu Fiqh, I get this as a question from freshman students. Okay. Well, going through Ar Risala, you're going to see that uh, Imam Shafi'i, um, for lack of better terms, uh, becomes more of a literalist. For lack of better terms, I'm not trying to say that in a negative way. And don't get me wrong, I have the utmost and the deepest of respect for Imam al-Shafi'i uh, But it's more about how consistent can you be with the traditions of the Prophet wasallam, as opposed to expanding well beyond that and doing what Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi did. And Abu Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal pretty much was on the same lines, but he became even more of a literalist and then Imam al-Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi. So that would be the prime difference that I see, at least in my study. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But if we want to really get an understanding, ar risala is translated in English. Read it. Right? And there's a lot to learn from that. So I would refer you to there, inshallah, to get more insight. Just to let everybody know, I have a risala in English uh, in our library upstairs. Our library will be officially open, inshallah ta'ala, from March. It is under development. We currently have only 1,000 books. We plan to have 3,000 books. There is an opening for everybody, inshallah. For everybody, not only uh, you know, those who could just read Arabic. We are planning to open for everybody. We get some books in all languages. So give us a bit more time, inshallah. And if you want to help this team, 
I do need a lot of help. Okay? A lot of the ulama, they have a lot of books at home. They just, just there. Just leave it here, inshallah. And when you need it, you take it back. That's all. Okay? Inshallah. Uh, I don't have any more questions from upstairs here. Anyone else, please? I would like to close this because we start well then walk to the, uh, our multi-purpose room. I could see his hundreds of his books are just uh, shining. And he's going to go there. And those of you who want to uh, purchase the book, you could do that as well. Uh, inshallah. So anyone else have any other questions? Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, you're making the book more accessible to the English-speaking students. I just wanted to know how long did it take you to compile this and the other things you're working on? Yeah, so this took four years. The, preparing the manuscript probably took two and a half, but then comes the editing process and the typesetting and all that, all the other stuff that comes. But the manuscript itself, that took two and a half years. And the thing that I'm actively working on right now is the English commentary in Sahil Bukhari. Okay, yes, go ahead. No, when you say manuscript, manuscript actually means the work, right, that you've uh, you've prepared. So the the book that I use, the Jamia al Masanid, it's probably printed I don't know over a hundred years ago. It's very old. Uh, and then, it, you know, in the beginning, they give you the photocopies of the originals that they basically had taken from. So that's all there. But the publisher's name and everything, that's all at the back in the bibliography. You can get it from there, inshallah. Just quickly, what are your sources you're using for your commentary inside your Because I'm a college I'm, So I use Ibn Battal, Fathul Bari, Umdatul Qari. Um, I was using Kashful Bari in the beginning. Um, I'm using Taqreer Bukhari. And lately, um, Sheikh Yunus's uh, Taqreers, they're now being published. So I'm using that as well. No, it's uh, something. Uh, some. Are you using Faidul Bari as well? No, I'm not using Faidul Bari. No. Okay. no. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, I'm going to stop here now, inshallah. Jazakallah, everyone, for attending this. As you can see, uh, the talk and the QA, we have a different audience here. Uh, I have a good news for you. Remember, I said to you, inshallah, ta'ala, we have uh, another book, inshallah, ta'ala. it's going to be in March. I don't know the exact date here. And it's one of the author, he's a muhaddith in this country, everybody knows him or should know him. And just recently he has written over 35 to 40,000 pages in 43 volumes, uh, writing the biography of female hadith scholars called al-muhaddithat. Anyone here knows who I'm talking about? Sheikh Akram. Sheikh Akram, Sheikh, uh, so Sheikh Akram and Nadri al-muhaddith, inshallah ta'ala. He will be uh, attending, inshallah ta'ala. Again, I haven't uh, fixed the time. We had a time. We fixed a date last year. Unfortunately, the Sheikh was ill, but inshallah, we're going to fix the time this year. And I'll let you know, inshallah ta'ala. And uh, he's going to talk about muhaddithat, the female. Uh, we're talking about women's contribution to hadith specifically, and, and, and you know, their contribution to our deen. So this time, we're all going to go upstairs and fill the hall with the sisters. I'm, I'm not joking. Sisters will remain upstairs, inshallah. But we will be here. So it's going to be for us as well, or for everybody, inshallah. Let you know uh, in good time as well. Now I'm going to ask Ustaz to go at the back of the room. Brother Kamal is there. And I'm going to have a chair there, inshallah. And if you want to, uh, you know, to get a sign from you, you can do that as well. And if you are not buying the book, please don't go at the back. Because I'm going to give you only 10 minutes. And then I have to, some of the sisters would like to come downstairs as well to take the books as well. So if you're not buying the book, don't go there. If you just want to see the book, I've got two copies here. You want to take selfie with the books come from inshallah. Yeah, to stay here. But if you're buying the book, then please go at the multi-purpose. And once again, I would like to thank uh, Ustaz Umar for coming all the way from uh, Canada, alhamdulillah. I'm sure everybody here benefited. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So sister, those of you listening, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to make an announcement when you can come downstairs, inshallah ta'ala. Shukran. Thank you for having us. Do you recognize your stuff? Of course. How can I not recognize it? <laughs> He's tied to hide from you. How are you doing? Thanks for that talk. Alhamdulillah. 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 Alhamdulillah.